Yeah, cool. Then, Peter, welcome to Accento um, officially. And um, it's really great to have you here. You were already here last year. You're a returning speaker, so that's excellent. Um, mm -hmm. Who are you? What are you doing? Um, what's your What's your interests? Um, what are you thinking about? Well, <laughs> um, doing conferences and uh, workshops and stuff is basically all I do. Um, back before the pandemic, I really spent most of my time on the road, um, just um, traveling around to conferences or to companies talking about JavaScript, web technologies, HTML5, CSS, the whole deal. That's basically who I am and what I do slash did until until the virus hit. Okay, cool. Then I guess the, the, the topic is uh, fitting in that sense. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, JavaScript, as I see from the title, right? Yeah, about JavaScript performance or um, more importantly, not about uh, you know, detailed performance optimization, but rather about getting an understanding of how a JavaScript engine works, how JavaScript engines see our code and what they do to our code to make it run fast. So this is basically the really high level overview. It's not about um, any black magic relating to performance optimization, but really just this is how an engine works. This is how just-in-time compilers optimize our code. This is basically all the terms and the principles behind making JavaScript run fast from the browser's perspective. And hopefully we can take something from this. Basically, by knowing what the JavaScript engine wants to do, we can maybe help it along a little bit by just tuning our code in very small ways. That sounds very, very interesting. So I will dive right into it and see if we can share the, the video. Hello and welcome to my talk, JavaScript through the eyes of a JavaScript engine. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm a trainer for front-end web technologies. When there's no pandemic going on, I usually travel all around the continent to teach people about the latest in browser APIs. That is HTML5, JavaScript, and sometimes even CSS and TypeScript. There's a bunch of blue stuff on the screen right now. This is where you can follow me online. There's a blog you can read. There's tweets you can follow. I'm on a podcast called Working Draft. That's mostly in German, but there's the occasional English episode thrown in there as well. And you might also want to check out my side project, Warhol. Warhol is all about automated design testing. So if you want to have a tool in your browser, a browser extension that checks your design right inside your browser window, check out Warhol. We are going to launch in just a few weeks. But today's topic is web pages and more specifically JavaScript through the eyes of a JavaScript engine. There's two main topics that we are going to cover today, parsing JavaScript and then executing JavaScript and making JavaScript go fast. This is all from the perspective of the JavaScript engine. I'm not going to talk about how we can optimize performance really, but it's more about understanding how JavaScript engines work and why certain things are the way they are. Optimizing performance is of course cause the underlying um, motivation for this talk, but we are not really going to talk about how you write fast code. It's more about how JavaScript engines make your code run fast. But an interesting question before this is to consider what really is a fast program? What's a slow program and how fast can a program possibly be? Let's list all the properties of the fastest possible program that we can imagine. Well, there's at first, of course, the requirement that the fastest possible program must only perform the necessary operations and nothing else. It can't do less than the necessary operations, but it also must not do anything more. Anything that's not necessary it just makes the program run slow. This is the first property of the fastest possible program. And the second property is, uh, well, there isn't really any, right? If you want to write a fast program, the only thing you can do is to strip it down to the necessary operations and eliminate everything else. If we are talking about the level of, for example, CPU design, then of course you can do stuff like branch prediction and stuff. But when it comes to writing programs and to executing program as a JavaScript engine, all you can do is get rid of everything that's not strictly necessary. Okay, with that in mind, how can we get from written JavaScript that's human readable to a fast running program on our computer? 
There's two steps to this. And the first is to make the handwritten JavaScript understandable to the computer. And this is where the parser comes in. A parser is basically just a function that takes code and turns it into a data structure that the computer can then operate on. This data structure is called an abstract syntax tree or AST for short. And the AST is really just a tree data structure. It looks, for example, something like this on the right hand side. On the left is our JavaScript program just declaring a variable and on the right hand side is our AST. And this AST looks, well, reasonable, I guess. It's just a simple tree containing a program and the program contains a body and the body consists of all the statements in the program. In this case, just a variable declaration. And you can see how the code on the left hand side maps to the AST on the right hand side. There's a, a, direct, a direct connection for basically every bit in the code. This connection comes a, becomes a bit less obvious for more complicated examples of code. JavaScript is very expressive, meaning you can encode a lot of information in very few characters. For example, this loop right here is just two lines more than the variable declaration we had before, but the resulting AST is much larger. That's because this simple for loop isn't really that simple at all. It contains destructuring and inside the loop's body we actually do some string interpolation using template literals. That's a whole bunch of stuff encoded in relatively little code and the resulting AST is sort of huge. Okay, this is what a parser does. It takes JavaScript code, handwritten text and turns it into something that's machine readable, that's a data structure that the JavaScript engine can then build upon. This is what a parser does. Why should we care about parsing? Well, first and foremost, we should care about parsing because this is a universal bottleneck that every script in every page has to go through. Every bit of code that you write needs to be parsed. Every bit of code that you didn't write, but included anyway, third-party scripts, for example, needs to go through the parser. Browser extensions, for example, inject content scripts into pages. Guess what? Needs to be parsed. And the time that the browser spends parsing JavaScript is quite substantial. V8, the JavaScript engine in Chrome and Node.js and also Electron, spends about 20% of its whole time parsing JavaScript. So that's 80% executing JavaScript and 20% just understanding what it has to execute. And this is V8 on a desktop. On mobile, it becomes a little bit hairier because mobile CPUs are very good at saving energy, but not as good as just, you know, doing computation. And so parsing on mobile takes substantially longer than on desktop com um, computers. As a rule of thumb, the worst case that you should consider is probably a parser that can do one megabyte of JavaScript per second. That's not much, if you consider how much JavaScript is on today's web pages. This is a summary of the steady climb of JavaScript payload size over time, over the last five years. And as you can see, the median values are around about half a megabyte of JavaScript on every page, no matter if it's for desktop pages or for mobile pages. This is just the median, meaning that there's quite a lot of pages that are much larger when it comes to JavaScript payload size. A few are, well, not as, not as much of a problem, but half a megabyte of JavaScript is something that you have to expect from one of today's pages. So you get a picture of how long parsing can take if you add lots and lots of JavaScript to your web page. Okay, but this is about how browsers deal with JavaScript. This is not about us. So what do engines do to speed up parsing? Well, there's two strategies that are important. The first is caching, of course. That's always a good idea. And there's also pre-parsing, also known as lazy parsing, that helps with speeding up um, parsing quite a bit. If you just have a function definition somewhere in your JavaScript code, the JavaScript engine will probably only check it for syntax errors and will not actually pass the function fully. That's because most functions in most JavaScript programs never get called. Think about stuff like event handlers, for example. Most buttons will never get clicked, most links will never be followed, so most event handlers will never be called. And to um, basically profit from this to optimize the parser for this usage pattern of functions, each function only gets checked for syntax errors first, and only when the function gets actually called will a full pass be um, done afterwards. So the JavaScript engine is basically procrastinating. It's just doing the necessary work at the moment and then basically hopes that the 
whole bunch of work. The full work, the full pass will never become um, necessary because the function will never get called. So we defer, well, procrastinate on the non-critical work and just speculate and hope that we get through with this. Now, how does the JavaScript engine figure out that a function will never get called? That's actually quite interesting. If we just have a function definition and then a function call, then it's quite simple. The function gets defined and the function call comes sometime later. So the JavaScript engine knows that it can get away with a pre-pass for the function foo at first, do a full pass afterwards when the function gets called and then execute the function. This means that we actually um, process foo twice. We first do the pre-pass, check for the syntax errors, and then do the full pass before we call the function. So the function foo actually occupies the parser with more than the time than it takes to pass the function, right? Because we pass the function after we've pre-passed it. This is another example of an immediately invoked function expression. Here, there's no pre-pass at all. The JavaScript engine knows that this, this function bar is going to be executed right here at the end. And so it's not going to bother with the pre-pass. So in sum, this is faster in a way because we, script the, we, we skip the pre-pass step. How does the JavaScript engine know that the function is going to be called sometime later? Well, just infers that this is the case from the leading parentheses right here. This there um, is information that the JavaScript engine just assumes points to there being a call at the end. So the JavaScript engine knows that when it first encounters the function processing the program code left to right, that it can skip, can skip the pre-pass step right here and then immediately do the full pass. So you, as a, a smart JavaScript engineer, might think, well, I can wrap any function definition in parentheses and then skip to the full pass um, for every function, and so skip the pre-pass. This, again, in sum, is faster than doing the pre-pass first and the full pass afterwards, because we basically skip a whole step. So this is something that actually works. This will take less time if the function actually does get called in the end. And you don't even have to do this trick yourself. You don't have to add parentheses yourself. There's even a program for this called Optimize.js that can do this step for you. Just takes your JavaScript, adds a bunch, or a bunch of parentheses, and then um, spits out JavaScript that's meant to be faster. But is it really? Should you try to trick the parser? Should you try to hack your way to better performance? Well, in my opinion, that's not really the greatest idea you can have, because first of all, when it comes to parsing, this is a comparatively small win. All you save is a function's pre-pass step, and this pre-pass step takes roughly half the time a full pass will take. So this is not really that much um, of a win that you can achieve, and first of all, and more important, it's not always a win because it's only a win for functions that actually do get called at some point in the program. And as we've talked about, this isn't always the case. No button, it's not true that every button in your web page will get clicked, so not every event handler will fire. This heuristic um, of skipping um, the full pass for some function and doing only a pre-pass is there for a reason. Another reason is um, that you might want to skip um, doing the full pass in the critical path, meaning when the browser first encounters your script and tries to understand it all, the megabytes of JavaScript, and tries to process it, it top to bottom. If there's anything in there that's not critical at the moment, this is probably a good thing to defer into the future, to procrastinate on. In the critical path, when the browser first encounters your script, there's probably a more urgent thing to do than um, pass a function fully when a pre-pass will probably do. And the most important bit, why this is probably not an approach to, approach to performance that you want to take, is su such things represent moving targets. Heuristics like this vary between browsers and JavaScript engines, and even between JavaScript engine versions. So trying to trick the browser into being faster is probably not the greatest idea. There's easier ways you can achieve wins when it comes to parsing. Your parsing can be sped up much more easily when you remember that parsing costs increase increase with the JavaScript payload's size. So what you should do is simply exterminate all unnecessary code. Even functions that never run um, occupy the parser. 
And they shouldn't be there because, as we've talked about, the fastest program we can imagine is the program that only contains the necessary bits. And if there's anything in your code that will never get called, that's just there because of some dependency or some edge case, you should try as hard as you can to get rid of this. This is how you can speed up the parser. Just delete code. Delete as much code as you can. Now, we are programmers. We sometimes do delete code, but mostly we write code. And the way we can write code that's easy for the parser to understand is to keep the code as boring as possible. Because that's what the parser is optimized for. It's optimized to be fast for real-world JavaScript. So if you just write real-world JavaScript without doing anything crazy, you're probably helping the parser along to be faster. There's other things you can do. You can, for example, use asynchronous scripts. Um, some browsers support streaming parsers. For those, async scripts can then be streamed, and that's uh, faster under some so circumstances. But the bottom line is, write as little code as you can get away with, but keep this code as boring and as normal as possible. That's the way to helping the parser to be as fast as possible. To break it down to a simple statement, no code can ever be as fast as no code at all. Seems obvious, but if you take a look at JavaScript payloads and dependency trees, it appears it's not that obvious at all. So, this is how we can get to a smaller AST, simply having less code. But an AST is not something that we can execute. An AST is just a data structure. It's not executable code that we can run in our browser. So, what do we need to do next? Well, we need to turn it into an executable code. We need to compile it in some way to turn it into, for example, bytecode or some sort of instruction that the browser can then execute. And this step needs to happen as fast as possible. When a function gets called, it needs to be transformed from the AST into runnable code as quickly as possible. The problem is, if you try to compile something as quickly as possible, the resulting code is probably not the fastest code you can imagine. And there's other reasons why this first stage of compiling your AST into executable code will result in slow code. But JavaScript engines have a solution for this. They simply engage optimizing compilers probably in several stages when necessary and when the um, circumstances allow for it. Not all JavaScript engines do this in quite the same way, but the underlying principles are totally identical. So we can just talk about this in the abstract with, without referring to, for example, V8 or um, Chakra or what have you. This is how all JavaScript engines, all major JavaScript engines in all the browsers work in principle when it comes to optimizing code. We start with the JavaScript parser. We've already seen this. We turn JavaScript into an AST. This AST is then delivered into our first stage of compiler, interpreter, generally some sort of process that takes your AST and turns it into something that we can execute. This is our first bit of executable code, and that's slow for a variety of reasons. The first one being that this transformation has to happen as fast as possible, so we cannot really um, spare much of considerations for speed. This whole process has to be fast, but the result doesn't have to be, and it probably can't be. So we have executable code after our first stage, and then we run the code. The functions get executed, and a runtime analysis process keeps an eye on the functions being called. We check what the inputs and output of the functions are, and if there's um, a regular pattern to this, we can try to engage an optimizing compiler that then generates a faster version of the slow code that we had before. This relies on assumptions, and we are going to talk about the assumptions in just a minute. Um, but this is generally speaking, to put it simple, just a faster version of the code we had before. This faster code is also monitored by runtime analysis, so we can make sure that all of our assumptions from before hold true in the future. If the assumptions don't hold true, we can deoptimize and fall back to our executable code from before, which is slow, but is guaranteed to work even when our assumptions don't hold true. And if the assumptions do hold true, we then can, depending on the JavaScript engine, engage another stage of optimizing compiler that then generates even faster machine code. And there can be um, two stages, there can be way more stages, it really depends on the JavaScript engine. V8, for example, this is the JavaScript engine in Chrome, in Node, and in Electron, just has two stages, while JavaScript Core, which is what, we, what you will find in Safari and React Native, has four stages. But what the stages do is generally all the same, it's just um, in some engines fine-grained and in other engines not as fine-grained, but the general process is the same. Now, 
There are stages that optimize code. But what does optimization actually mean? What happens when code gets optimized? Well, there's two things. The first is that we turn um, the level of abstraction down. When we start from left and move to the right while we optimize our program, we start with something that's really high level abstraction, just JavaScript to something that's more in the middle, the byte code, and then the mach machine code over on the right is basically unreadable to humans, but it's really close to the metal for the computer and thus is relatively fast. This is relatively straightforward, right? We go from, from something from something that's a high level of abstraction and thus slow to something that's on a much lower level, much closer to the metal, much faster. This is the first step that happens in all of the engines. Now, what does this first stage, this bytecode, actually look like? Let's take a look at a sort of simple example. There's some JavaScript um, in the top half of the slide right here. We declare a variable, have a function, and this function is sort of um, complicated because it uh, takes two arguments. One of the arguments has a default value, this object here with its value set to zero, and then we do a sort of an addition and then print it to the console. If you take this um, code, wrap it in a JavaScript file, and call node with a few extra arguments, you can actually get the V8 bytecode printed to the screen. And you can even filter it to only include the bytecode for a function. If we do this and then run this um, JavaScript file in node with these extra command line arguments, we actually get to see the bytecode. This is the result of the first stage, after the browser has taken our JavaScript, has passed it, and has turned it into the first stage of executable code, the slow version. Now, this um, looks familiar to you if you've ever seen something like a virtual machine in action, if you've seen instructions for virtual machines, but it's still sort of high level. You can see this because there's stuff in here like jumped if not undefined and create object literal that does sound like sort of high level operations. It's just a not really intuitive syntax what we have here. But this is really um, just a machine readable version, an executable version of the AST. The AST is just the um, machine readable version of your JavaScript source code, and that's the executable version that happens when we process the AST. So this is still sort of high level, and this is the reason why this is still comparatively slow. Unoptimized JavaScript is slow because JavaScript is specified to be ridiculously dynamic and very flexible. And the uh, first code that we've seen, the, mach the uh, machine code, um, is the more um, low-level version. And this is not as um, flexible and dynamic. So um, to make a, to um, explain how this um, works, let's take a look at a, again, simple function. What does this function do? Well, the only correct answer is it applies the addition operator to A and B. The addition operator, of course, being the plus sign. What does the addition operator actually do? Well, if we take a look into the ECMAScript specification, this is the description of the addition operator. And this is not only not really straightforward, but it's also a very complicated and high-level process. As you can see, this algorithm that explains how A plus B works contains multiple references to other and processes defined in the specification, like get value to primitive and to string and so on. The specification really deals with how any value plus any other value returns in returns some kind of result. And the addition operator is so complicated that the, that the specifications themselves contain extra nodes that explain to the reader that the addition operator can do either string concatenation or addition, because it's just not obvious from the description of the algorithm itself. So the addition operator is an extremely complicated and extremely flexible bit of JavaScript logic. But in most cases, if you write a function that does A plus B, A and B are probably most of the time of the same type over and over and over again. You do not need all of this flexibility all the time. And this is how optimization works. We do not only reduce the level of abstraction, but we also get rid of a whole bunch of flexibility. 
because we've watched our program, we've done our runtime analysis, and we know that in this in the case of a specific function, plus is only used to do, for example, numeric addition, and there's never any string, never any null involved in there. So this is how JavaScript engines do this optimization for types, for example. If we pass our JavaScript, turn it into inter interpretable code, and have executable code that's running slow, we can at least run this code and do runtime monitoring to figure out if A, the function does ever get called at all, or does it called, get called frequently if the function is hot. If the function is hot, if it gets called over and over and over again, we can also analyze anal analyze the parameters and figure out if the arguments to the function are always the same. Or um, a function in this case might also be something like the addition operator. And if the inputs to the addition operator or the function are always the same, we can then just provide feedback to the optimizing compiler and essentially tell the compiler, hey, this addition, addition operator here, this op addition operator in this place never does string concatenation. It's always used for numbers. So take the executable code boil it down to machine code, much lower level and therefore much faster, and also get rid of all of the exceptions for strings and nulls and objects, because from, from our runtime analysis, we know that this function is only ever going, going to get called with numbers. So the optimized machine code is not only low level, but it's also gotten rid of a bunch of exceptions, a bunch of stuff that's specified in JavaScript, and there's that's probably supported in your program. This should probably work. It's still JavaScript, but because we know from observing the program that bunch of uh, a bunch of these exceptions never happen, we can just, you know, um, get away with only optimizing for numbers. And this is what happens. If we take this um, simple uh, test function foo that uses the addition operator, we can um, make optimizations visible to us um, as people who are using the debug build of v8 by doing the following. We take the function foo, call it a bunch of times, and by calling the function we provide feedback to the optimizer. The, the engine is going to monitor our use of foo, is going to see that we only ever call foo with numbers, and not only with numbers, but with integers, small integers to be precise, and then if you not use node, but rather a debug build of v8, you get a few extra functions that look like this. Optimize function on next call. This is basically a debug tool that enables us to force the JavaScript engine to optimize this function when we call it the next time. And this then, um, can, this then turns the, um, the extra stage, Turbofan in v8, on and turns foo into machine code into something that's much lower level than the slow executable code from before. And when we then do a debug print of this function, we get a bunch of output that's totally unreadable. But if you just um, concentrate on the important bit, you can see that when we code the function with small integers, force the engine to optimize the function based on this feedback. In the resulting machine code, we can then see that this operation has been optimized to support signed small integers. So small numbers that we've passed into the function before. If at any point we pass in something that's not a small integer, a string, an object, null, something else, we can always fall back into our executable code that we had before, the slow version with all the exceptions. But as long as we have um, from monitoring the function's use over time, the knowledge that this function is only ever going to get used with the same types of arguments, with numbers and small numbers to be precise, we can use our optimized machine code that's a lower level and this, that has get, gotten rid of a bunch of exceptions that could make it slow. We can always fall back to the slow code if necessary, but in the general case, we can rely on our assumptions holding true. So this is how JavaScript engines optimize for types for function arguments in this case and for arguments to operators like the addition operator. And this is just an illustration of how it works in general. We've seen how the parser works and we have seen um, the general approach to making code run fast in a JavaScript engine. So to summarize, JavaScript engines always optimize code in stages. There are several stages your handwritten JavaScript goes through when you run it in your browser. There's 
certain um, measures that the JavaScript engine takes to make it run faster. It lowers the level of abstraction and eliminates corner cases. That's the basic um, the, 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 that, that's the basic operation that we've seen in this talk. There's also other operations that the JavaScript engine uses. For example, it uses inline caches for objects. This is out of scope for this talk, but in general, it's what you expect the JavaScript engine to do, what you expect any runtime for any programming language to do to optimize performance. And the important bit is that we've seen how I um, show V8's bytecode and V8's machine code, but the even when the stages are different between browsers and engines, the principles are always the same. So code that runs fast in one browser engine is also able to run fast in another brow browser's engine, provided that both, uh, both engines um, are as good as each other um, at optimizing performance. And if we want to make our code run fast, it's quite simple, really. We need to write um, predictable, boring JavaScript code. Write code that you would write anyway if you wanted to write the most readable, boring, understandable code, because that's what the JavaScript engine itself is optimized for. If you can program like you are in a static, uh, statically typed language, or if you're even using something like TypeScript, do so. The JavaScript engine likes static typing, even if the JavaScript language itself does not support it. And um, this inline caches stuff we've seen before, another optimization strategy for browser engines, it's basically something that um, benefits from you keeping object structures the, structures the same. So if you create a new object, initialize all the fields, never use delete, and so on. In any case, you should remember that premature optimization is and remains the root of all evil. So when it comes to do's and don'ts, you should delete all the code you can. That's the simplest performance optimization that you can perform. It speeds up parsing and it speeds up ex execution, obviously. You should not overdose on third-party packages. And if you do, activate tree shaking in your build tool to get rid of everything. Every function that you can delete or can remove from your bundle is worth it. You should write boring and predictable code because that's what the JavaScript engine is optimized for. And you should not try to outsmart the engine. The engine does um, continuous continuous um, monitoring of the functions in your code as it is um, executing the code. The JavaScript engine has way more information than you do, so just write boring, predictable code and be done with it. It helps to program like you are in a statically typed language and you shouldn't really rely on JavaScript's quirks, quirks unless it's absolutely necessary to achieve some kind of goal. But probably, again, write boring code. This is the best you can do. And the most important bit really is you should get your actual job done. You do not need to overthink performance until you have to, but JavaScript engines are really good at making your code run fast so you don't have to think about it. Write fewer code, make it as boring as possible, and then it will probably be fast without you even thinking about it. There's a bunch of more um, topics that I could touch on if I only had more time, but I don't. So I'm just going to recommend um, this talk um, this article, this article, and this article, if you want to dive deeper into how JavaScript engines make your code run faster. This touches on everything I've talked before, but of course, course goes into way more detail, um, which the articles and the talks can, because um, I cannot. My time is up. I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you. Wow, Peter, that was uh, quite the deep dive. Um, do you think so? Well, I don't know. I mean, some people were already uh, saying in the chat that they uh, they are hoping never to have the, the, the necessity to go into the bytecode, but I thought it was quite interesting. Before we, we dive into the questions where we already have a few of them uh, there, um, how did you get to this topic? Did you just sort of say one day, um, why is this so slow or why is this performing the way it is? I need to figure this out or what was No, 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 not this? at all. Okay. Um, there was a conference and some guy that was organizing the conference asked me if I wanted to do a session about performance. Okay. Okay. And so I did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Very I mean, you, cool. have to re you have to remember, uh, in my, in, in my day job before the pandemic, I did very little coding on real projects. So performance right. wasn't really anything I even cared about and I knew nothing about it. Yeah. So this is um, 
this talk reflects my personal history with performance, with researching the topic really, from okay. really um, starting at the at the um, highest level. What can I do? What should I do? And then finding out the underlying reasons for the best practices. So you probably never have to look at the bytecode, and even I could probably have stopped some time before there. But it's really interesting, even if you know nothing about um, how to read stuff like this. You can, if you're a programmer, read enough from this to get an idea of something. And that's yeah. always just enlightening. It's not really useful for everyday work, but it's just, ah, this is how it's the world is arranged in this case. Uh, super interesting. I think uh, I may also not have a need to go maybe into the device code, but I think I may try it out because those notes, command line flags seem, seem quite straightforward to use. Yeah, it's um, really easy. And um, there's even uh, there's a package that I didn't mention in the talk, but this is um, just something that allows you to install debug builds of different JavaScript engines. This works just like NPM. You can just type, give me the debug build of V8 or of Spider Monkey or from JavaScript Core, and you get it pre configured, installed, compiled for your system, and you can use all the debug, debug flags you want to really dive deep into this and there's also a secret um tool in chrome this is something like the performance panel um that you know from just optimizing your web pages rendering performance but really right. deep down into the intric intricacies of the v8 engine where you can re really get flame charts of the individual function calls in the parser and stuff like this okay Cool. I mean, um, I have a question from uh, from Klaus who's asked for. Uh, you posted some links at the end for getting more information. That maybe you at the end of the of the discussion we can also post those in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you uh, could take the time afterwards just to put those in the chat and we we have access to them. Yeah, um, sure. Klaus, and I will also upload the uh, slides to somewhere so you can all excellent. look at this again. Click on the links again. Cool. Um, Klaus also asked as one of the first questions, and I also had this question written down in my notes. Um, you talked about uh, boring code, right? Like uh, one of the main things you can do is just write normal boring code so that the uh, the JavaScript optimizer or the JavaScript parser, it just can do its work and it doesn't get surprised and it doesn't get de-optimized and it can benefit from all the, the work put into it. And you touched a little bit on on, uh, on normal code, I think, at the end. You, you explained a little bit. You have other tips like things we should avoid, like maybe doing in JavaScript or things we should try to do more uh, that help us uh, or help the, the JavaScript engine? Yeah, I think the um, important bit about boring code, what I meant by this is really um, don't think about the JavaScript engine too much and just focus on preventing uh, unnecessary work. And mm -hmm. that's it. Back in the day, just a few years ago, JavaScript wasn't nearly as fast, so many of the optimizing steps that we talked about were not really implemented in the JavaScript engines. There were no mm -hmm. optimizers as such. So if you wanted your code to go fast, you had to do this yourself. Like unrolling loops and inlining functions, you had to do this yourself. But this is really something that you totally should not do today. Just write boring everyday code, like you would uh, write code for maximum readability. Mm -hmm. And the only performance optimization that you should do if things get slow is really prevent unnecessary work. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I think writing boring code is also from a maintenance. I mean, it's both good for the comp it's for the compiler and for the runtime as well as for the humans, right? In, in general, or typically uh, boring code is often now, uh, also easier to understand. So there might be uh, a double benefit there. Yeah, but yeah. still... Um, you should. Um, there's there's still a trade-off in some way. Um, what I was doing just before my uh, computer exploded was yeah. um, I worked on a function that did um, some complicated stuff on a huge chunk of data, and it did th this stuff in three stages: transform data from A to B, from B to C, and then uh, create the final result. But this led to all of this work being done in essentially three loops over the um, data over and over again. But this is quite readable because it's first do this to the data, then to that to the data, and then produce the final result. I'm now turning this into a single loop where everything happens um, kind of much together, not mm -hmm. as readable, but it's slightly more, slightly more performant because okay. the, there's only one loop. It's still not crazy because I didn't write this um, for the benefit of the JavaScript engine, but this is just uh, broken down in a way that the JavaScript engine can then make it fast again, and it's still something that I can defend in code review. 
Right. So that's basically then the next stage, right? So the first is we write an, an not unsurprising, boring code. And the next stage, like you said, you still have a performance issue or you think like this could be faster and then you can do things to optimize your code. But you, like you said in the talk, you know, like premature optimization, I think, this is a quote that's be a bit overused. I think uh, people seem to think that this means never optimize your code. It just means um, don't optimize things that you don't think are necessary or where you don't have any data that's necessary. But it's perfectly okay to think about, you know, how will the system handle this? What is a sensible way to structure this? Like you said, three loops maybe is not a good idea. One loop may be better. So that's that's still something that's uh, that's sensible to do, I guess, as a developer. Totally. Um, there were some questions from uh, Marcus Klepper and uh, from Samuel, uh, both touching a little bit on TypeScript. So, because obviously with TypeScript, we are able to annotate our JavaScript code uh, or like our TypeScript code with types. And so we can give hints to the system. In general, we compile those hints out. Like basically we compile down to, to JavaScript or transpile to JavaScript. But um, would there be a way for engines or are there engines that can, can read the TypeScript that maybe can use those types? You know anything about, um, about that? Uh, yeah, this um, doesn't happen today, and I would bet huge money on this never happening at all. Okay. Uh, there's many reasons. First of all, TypeScript has, um, well, it's TypeScript's, TypeScript's core principle is that it doesn't adhere to semantic versioning, so each new version of TypeScript breaks something, and this is by design because breaking code by making type checks better and better is what TypeScript is all about. So this would not be a stable companion that the JavaScript engines really want to work with. And the second argument is that what TypeScript considers to be a type is different from what the JavaScript engine uh, sees as a type. For example, in TypeScript, we have at most two uh, kinds of numbers. Um, that is uh, regular JavaScript numbers and big int, and that's it. But for optimizing on the lowest levels in the JavaScript engines, you also want to have a huge integer and a small integer, maybe a medium integer, maybe signed, maybe not signed, and so on. This is all stuff that you really don't want to have to think about in TypeScript because that's not a low-level system programming language, but this mm -hmm. is what the browser in the end, the JavaScript engine and the metal in your computer has to work with. OK. OK, interesting, cool. Um, do we have another question here? No, we just had a comment from uh, from Andoni regarding that the code must be dumb and explicit. The people must be smart. Yeah, <laughs> people people should be smart, I guess. Um, yeah, I had um, yeah. No, no, go ahead. I had, I had written down because you you posted the example of the the plus uh, operator in uh, from the, the the specification quasi how it has to be handled. I thought that was really interesting because that explains quite a lot. You know, the, the, those examples that you often see thrown around where people are doing a Boolean plus a string or a Boolean plus a number, what happens? Uh, this explains quite a bit there. Uh, did, did you find that specification easy to read or uh, easy to get through? Is it something no. in all mortal scripts? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, I think the, um, the, the ECMAScript specification is the hardest to read specification that I ever had to deal really? with. Really? Okay. And, in my, in my day job, I read a lot of specifications. When I want right. to know some, something about a browser engine, I don't look at MDN or can I use, but I go to the HTML spec, for example, straight. Yeah. Because that's what I used to. But the ECMAScript specification, like you said, is so um, abstract in a way that even simple operations like plus are defined with layers and layers and layers under them so that to get really to the point of what it's, what it actually, what it's actually doing, is uh -huh. really really unnerving and really it can eat your 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 weekends basically okay. okay do you know how big it is do you have a feeling for how many pages like a pdf or something or uh... i don't have this in my head right now okay. i mean but it's, it's 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 not really about it's not really really about the length um yeah. the html specification is super long because there's a bunch of stuff in there but it's really easy to read because everything is written straight to the point but you cannot do this with something as abstract and as flexible as JavaScript. So it has to be just layers and layers and layers. And there are a bunch of layers, not, but, but, but the JavaScript language core is quite compact still. There's not that many functions if you compare it to, I don't know, C++ or PHP or something. So mm -hmm. there's not, not much there, but it's layered and layered and layered to no end. And that makes okay. it kind of hard to follow. It's a little bit scary, but OK, uh, we can be glad that there is so much engineering power um, hid behind all the, the big engines like uh, the Chrome and V8 and Spider Monkey. you mentioned is the Firefox engine, uh, right? Uh, and yeah, so right. really, really cool. OK, 
Um, do we have any further questions from the public? I see anything in the chat? We covered that. Yeah, I think we covered that. Um, what did I wanted to check? Ah, yeah, I wanted to check. I wanted to ask a question because you mentioned like it's important to to reduce the amount of code that needs to get parsed. So uh, obviously we have tools that do tree shaking and that try to optimize uh, our bundles during builds. But in the end, you're not. Re I'm not really sure um, what actually gets used or not. Do you know of any tools or ways to to get this information from the browser? Like do something like load up the the web page in a test, like do an automated test or something, and then get some debug information that tells you the engine which says like, okay, I downloaded these five megabytes of JavaScript and I only executed or parsed uh, or executed these kinds of there uh, these parts. Is there a way to, to figure that out? I think there's stuff like this that analyze your bundle. Okay, um, but um, but. People say we have tree shaking, but yeah. if you take a look at how uh, popular tools like, for example, Webpack work out of the box, to get tree shaking to really work, you have to do a bit of hacking. You have to configure everything right and all the packages have to be in the right order. You need to be sure that you consume the ECMAScript module uh, version of a given package and not the, for example, common JS package. And I, after I tried to do this myself, I came to the conclusion that probably a lot of people think they have tree shaking in place, but actually don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the, 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 first, the first thing would, should really be to verify your assumption. Oh, I use Rollup, I use Webpack, I have tree shaking in, page, in, in place. But do you really? Do you really use the right packages, the module types that you really intend to use? Or um, do you, for example, consume a common JS packages that you don't really want to consume? Even right. writing a package yourself where you offer, um, for example, TypeScript um, definitions and common JS packages and ECMAScript packages is really not that straightforward because in Node's short lifespan, we've layered legacy upon legacy upon legacy. There's module systems all around. I think mo many people think they have tree shaking working, but they don't. Okay, I think that's a that's a good call to action. Maybe to uh, uh, introspect on our build systems or look on our code and see if we're really getting rid of all that code that we're thinking we're getting rid of. Because that's sort of the thing that I was getting after, right? How do we verify um, that we have? I mean, we can look at the download sizes, but um, yeah, it seems like that's a, an area for for quite some improvement. That's still possible. Yeah, and I would also say that um, today's JavaScript developers don't do uh, enough reinvention of the wheel, really. Because reinventing the wheel is always uh, portrayed as this thing you should never do. But if you take a look out there, out of the window, there's a whole bunch of different wheels on bicycles, <laughs> on cars. And they, they are all different. And it may be possible that your particular car can take another car's wheel and be perfectly fine. But it might also be the case that you have some kind of fancy sports car and you just have a wheel from some SUV that you can probably fit to your car and it probably will work in some sense, but it's probably not the best fit that you can have. And okay. if the problem is well understood by yourself and if you have a little bit of extra time, reinventing the wheel is really not that bad because all the open source packages out there that are popular are popular because they cover a whole bunch of use cases. And covering mm. much of use cases means you have to have a bunch of code that you don't need because you only have one use case. So if you That's don't true. have to recreate the entirety of Angular, because yeah. this is unreasonable, you cannot do this. Exactly. But if there's some library that does some string mani manipulation or something, some, some data structure that you can re-implement yourself, mm. maybe you should do this. OK. Yeah, that's, a, that's also a good call to action. I mean, to look at your dependency, see if that's uh, if everything should be a third-party dependency, if you should be dragging in those those big things, and who knows what else. Um, I think it makes sense. It's always a trade-off, of course. I mean, like you said, Angular versus uh, doing the lip, the, the, the string manipulation. Um, but yeah, cool. Really good advice. Um, Peter, I think we're uh, hitting up on the, the end of the slots. Um, um, mm -hmm by this time, where would people uh, go to follow you to figure out what you're doing? What's the best place to, to keep up to date um, with what you've published? Um, there's my web page, of course, petergröner.de without the dash. The guy with the dash is doing something that's not related to web development. I get his emails anyway, but <laughs> if, there's, if there's red on the web page, you are on the right place. Blue is the wrong guy. And there's okay. also my uh, Twitter account, sir uh, underscore uh, paper. P-E-P-E. -E. 
Okay. Um, and I'm also going to be um, again uh, on not this stage, but there's another session where I talk about uh, design quality as opposed to performance quality. Yeah. Uh, I guess in uh, about two hours. Yes, I think uh, one hour, right? Two o'clock. One hour, right? EST yeah. And uh, one o'clock UTC. Warhol, I think, is the title, and you'll be on the Ignite Talk, Quality Ignite Talk uh, topic there. Very That's cool. It. Then I don't know if I'm going to be able to see you there because I may. Uh, we're going to be in a, in another talk, I think. But I wish you a lot of fun there, and um, everybody else. Thank you for participating and viewing the stream here with Peter. Um, he's um, well. He's going to be around, I guess, since he's going to be back at uh, in one hour. And we are going to continue with the uh, JavaScript and web track in about five minutes uh, with Vishal Rai, and we're going to be talking about uh, the future of static code analysis and AI. So. In the meantime, uh, Peter, yeah, thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you and, for having me. Yeah, I have wish you a lot of fun in the in the conference here, and I hope to see you again next year. Of course, you certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Then bye.